Tripp and I speak with Wall Street Journal bestseller Zara Carson about her book, Six Weeks to Happy, and why spending your time in survival mode is preventing you from living your best life. They say marketing is a madman's game. So now we turn it over to the marketing madman with Nick Constantino and Trip Job. Happy Saturday. Welcome to the Marketing Mad Men, Trip Job and Nick Constantino on Extra 106.3, live from the Battery. And uh, good to see you, Nick. Yeah, it's been a while, man. We took a little uh, vac- a little vacay. Uh, took two weeks off of recording. I came back feeling refreshed, I guess you can say. It's hot in Atlanta, finally. Yeah. So that, that heat's starting to get to my brain, but uh, I'm doing good. How you doing, uh, bud? I'm doing great. I uh, got away, got a little uh, golf up in Pinehurst. And, yeah, that boy. Uh, you know... So uh, I did the. Just Are we the bragging long golf courses? Because I get to play Wade Hampton in two days. So oh, we bragging about golf. Are we bragging about golf yeah, courses? Well, I'm, uh, I'm also just about to go out to Half Moon Bay. So that uh, a boy. I, uh, <laughs> I never thought in my life that this would be a topic of conversation, but I think I've crossed to old man territory now. So yeah. I think this is. Well, yeah, uh, you're looking a little old. I, I think, uh, yeah. Older. <laughs> I think it's happened all at the same time. I think it's happened. Yeah. So I have a question for you, Trip. You ready for it? Okay. Have you ever? thought of, wanted to, or been approached about writing a book? I have been approached. Uh, I have thought about it. I've had a lot of people who've suggested. I have been in a couple of friends' books on leadership and things like that, sharing you know, case studies and experiences. Um, and then you know, one of my good mentors, um, uh, Brian Patrick Cork, suggested, he goes, you know, with all the um, articles I've written, all the uh, you know LinkedIn videos, et cetera. He goes, look, you've already got it. He goes, yeah. just take that and make it in a short story. But I think with just other things in life, it's just not been, it, it wasn't something burning for sure. me to do it. I think the content's probably there, but I've just had other things that uh, have been bigger priorities. Yeah. So my wife is published uh, in the Lancet and a bunch of other publications for her work in healthcare. And uh, the process of her just being published is so exhausting. Yeah. The citation and the quote, the things you have to do. And personally, I, I was a reader when I was young. I'm not a book reader. I just don't have the time to commit to doing it consistently enough. So I'm an article reader. I'm always just trying to read yeah. articles. So I like the short form also, personally. Uh, the reason I ask is our interviewee in the middle segment, uh, Mrs. Zara Carson, uh, wrote a book. So yep. um, she wrote a book, Six Weeks to Happy. Um, and I Only think, six weeks? Oh, that's the funny thing, right? And that's what we talked about a little bit. Well, so what I asked her was a lot of questions of, we, we got into the book and the nuance of it. And it's a really, it's, it's not a self-help book. It's a self-evaluation book. So you can understand how to proceed in the best way. But I asked a lot about, you know, how did you go from the wanting to write a book to writing a book? How do you brand it? How do you get to become a Wall Street Journal bestseller and an Amazon bestseller? Um, so we'll play that interview back. But I learned a lot from it. Um, and I think it fits in nicely with what we talk about, and that's brand building, okay? A book is part of your brand. Right, it cannot be. The brand is not part of the book. It doesn't go the other way. Right, and and it can't be your brand, right? It can't be the only thing. Right, I think that uh, the people I've seen that have done it and done it well that I've known um, have been out there. So the book becomes maybe a natural progression for what their social brand is. An extension, a progression, everyone's different. And right. how, and one of the things we talked about before we did the interview um, is even nowadays, the attention spans are so much shorter that the book is now part of this gamification and this quiz to see what you are and then to read the book to get more information that goes to the life coaching. And all these things come together holistically to build this brand. Um, so one of the things she has is uh, there's a quiz in there. So it's the life block quiz, and it pretty much asks a lot of questions. I did it right away, and then I did yeah. it again today for the goof. Um, so my ultimate thought is I always try to be as off the cuff as possible. The first time you do something, don't even really read right. it. Just answer, because otherwise you're, you're, you're not using your subconscious. You're thinking, yeah. So, of course, the first time I did it, it came out one thing. This time I did it, and because I was thinking about it a little bit more, I already done it once. I was a completely different thing. Um, but the point is, is that when you look about th- – this is a lot about neuroscience and – we spend a lot of time with soft sciences and it's like psychology and all that stuff. Yeah. And there's so much more science being put into it and to the personas and how to respond. Um, but the gamification was a progression of the book. And that's what I found fascinating. Yeah. She realized that a certain audience are never going to the Wall Street Journal to figure out if they should read this book or not. And the people that it would help the most aren't going to read it. 
right? Who reads the Wall Street Journal? Let's call it what it is, right? You're yeah. 45 plus reading the Wall Street Journal. And I say that as a doofus that used to actually read it on his way back and forth in D.C. every day. And I love the Wall Street Journal. I love the short blurbs in the beginning. I love that it's politically narrated, but not as bad as everything else yeah. is. I love the Wall Street Journal, but the average person probably doesn't need a self-help book as much as a 22-year-old trying to figure out what they're trying to do in life. So she put the gamification in, and I think it just reiterates what we always talk about, about what is your plan, how are you using different marketing right. tools to accomplish a brand, and how does it all come together? And what it sounds like she did is associate herself with that was the, that's kind of the game she's playing. She's associating herself with a market that she's looking to go after. Yes. Whether it really makes sense, but she understands that these users um, are probably someone who will be influenced or potentially influenced by the association with Wall Street Journal. Yes. And, and again, I think when you – on the interview, it was a great interview. We talked about everything about her book and the quiz and how she got to the point where she is is fascinating. Um, but again, it's really – you have to be consistent. You have to have long-term vision. You have to build a brand. And you know what? It might even be a buildup. She did a lot of research and studying and got certifications in neuroscience before she ever even wrote the book. Could you imagine right. the foresight to have to have plan, plan that far out? Yeah. Uh, and it's really worked for her, so I'm really excited about it. Well, so and I think, and, and look, in this case, we're talking about a book, but the same type of principles. I mean, I'm doing the same thing. I'll be uh, end of next month um, presenting on a panel, and it's, it's all in the bioeconomy space, the sustainable aviation fuel, which we see as a, you know, our clients are, are more and more interested in that. So, you know, it was an area that we worked hard to get on that panel. Sure. As an independent. Sure, you can't blow it. party, right? You got you to you put your research right. in, your time in. It has to be eloquently it's, spoken, but quick right. and to the point to keep people's attention. And, there, and there's a lot of opportunities we get asked to do things, and sometimes we'll do them because their associations we're involved in, and it's, it's good for our members, but there's other times where... This was an area that's growing. It's blowing up because of you know the Inflation Reduction Act last year, and we want to be early on that um, thought leadership curve. That's key part of our brand and people thinking about us because you know everyone's trying to get in there. And so it was it was a conscious effort, and uh, we'll see what happens. In, Are you uh, going to open with a joke? Uh, Is this not yeah, a joking so crowd? Have, Are so we going to open with an anecdote? Are we going to open? So I get, uh, I get, I think I get 18 minutes. Uh, this is a panel of four of us, and so it's about an hour. We have an hour and a half. Um, so it's you know we each get about 18 minutes, and then we get the Q and A. So um, yeah, I've got a little time before uh, we get there, but I'm usually the type that tries to uh, you know soften it a little bit and also relate. Build the media, uh, build the media, with the right? But it's also a bunch of chemical engineers, a bunch of uh, That's why investors, That's and things why like that. So. It has to be a, an appropriate joke. So yeah. I wonder. So th this is a perfect time to have this conversation and segue. So look, you, you're speaking in this conference. You know you're not speaking in this conference for the five minutes afterward. You know right. that there's a long-term plan, but you also know that that plan might not directly turn to sale. This is about influence. This is about so talk right. about that. Talk about like why you guys want to be on this panel because it's I'm sure the same reason why Zara wrote this book. What what is the long-term goal? What do you try to get out of it? Because you're peddling influence or sales. I mean, let's call it what it is. Yeah, so what's I mean, the goal? We're, we're you know business intelligence and consulting and research. So I mean, we we span a large several large industries, and for us. Um, we are that third party um, advisor for a lot of different companies that are looking to spend millions and in some cases these are you know billion dollar type projects. Uh, so for us it is to just enhance the credibility. We, we have the data, uh, but data is only one piece when someone sure. is looking at developing or investing in major projects. They want to understand how you think. You know, what's the thought process? How, you know, how big is your organization? You know, if we're, we're, look, we're going to be there and around people from United Airlines and Delta and America and sure. others, right? So we're not going to be top of mind, but they're going to want to understand and think about, boy, you know what? These individuals understand our market, where things are going, um, have a background that, you know, if the right opportunity comes up, yes, we, we know them. We, we want to learn about their brand. Yeah. Yeah, I think what you said is important. It's not just about data because, yeah. like, all the data on neuroscience, it's all out there. All the, you, If you want to learn and learn about how neuroscience and how you, the pathways work and how you can yep. think better and lower stress, I mean, shoot, there's not more information on anything in the world right now than that. That doesn't mean it's been packaged to a way for it to be approachable. Right. That doesn't mean that it's packaged to a way to be something you want to read and enjoy reading because, look, you can you can read a 60-page cited document. It doesn't mean you're going to absorb any of that information, right? So, again, exactly. it's not just – the data. I, I've gone back to this. I've said it many times, but I love the, the graphic with Legos about yeah. data. Like data is just Legos thrown on the floor. 
Okay, wow. and then sorted data is it's analyzed by color. But what people want is the freaking house to be built out of the Legos to tell that story about why it's there. Yeah. That's what you have to do. Exactly, and I think you know one of the things I was having a discussion with someone the other day, and you know it's not just okay. I'll use my example. It's not just us being up on that panel on this two day conference. It's the same thing with a book. It's the same thing if uh, you're doing your, you know, maybe a thought leadership white papers, et cetera. You know, I will be there um, the entire two days, you know, come in probably a day earlier. Um, you know, having the discussions with other panelists, that's a great opportunity. When you're on a panelist and have the speaker tag, you can start having that dialogue. Immediate, again, immediate rapport. You're right. something common, I'm, you're both speaking, all of a sudden you I'm, have your credibility for the versus the people who I'm just listen. I'm morning of day two, so I can start having that dialogue. People start to, oh, man, I, I definitely going to make sure I'm staying around for your panel. You know, then you, all of a sudden you start to make speakers who introduce you to other you know, potential. Are you allowed companies? to serve everybody two cocktails before you speak? Because that would be my go-to. I feel people more responsive, and I'm yeah. a better speaker with about two to three cocktails. Yeah, you go yeah. over that. It's just a, who knows. Well, the good news is uh, we are not the uh, after lunch on the last day. So we are just before lunch, I think, on the last day. So it's uh, it's not the dreaded people start to get out of town, people start to uh, get uh, you know uh, sleepy, et cetera, type thing. But but the but the point is, you know, I'm using the time to build up, make you know, make some uh, connections and things like that, and then afterwards continue to be open for that discussion. That's part of how we build our brand. And I yeah. think there are people who, and I've seen it probably more with white papers and technical industry, and and for the marketers out there, I go, boy, this is such hard work to get this white paper. We got it out. We pushed it out to all our customers, and then you let it go. That's just the that, start, man. Yeah, those exactly. white papers. I mean, if it just it's just like the you know the turning Google Analytics on and its work. That's just the beginning. If you don't know how to interpret this stuff, and now that GA four, it's a topical conversation. Yeah. Man, they changed everything just for the goof. It feels like they just changed the whole thing just to mess with people and see how engaged people yeah. were. So I think that's right. Yeah, um, and I think you know I think one of the things, and we'll talk about it obviously with uh, Zahara, um, is you know with white papers in a book, you've got this whole big you know, um, product, people forget in marketing the opportunity to take snippets of that and let of it course. live and breathe. So when we um, when we come back, uh, obviously we'll have uh, the conversation with Zara, and then uh, let's talk a little bit more about how do you make sure you use that content you develop For sure. um, best. So you are listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3. This morning in North Carolina, wheels are spinning. Determination is winning. A passion is now a thriving business, and it shows no signs of slowing down. How? The power of a conversation, like the one Clint Spiegel had with First Horizon Bank about starting a bike wheel manufacturing facility in Asheville. Now it's not just talk, it's rubber meets road. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Today, I'm happy and honored to have here Zara Carson. Um, we got a book. We got a quiz. We got a whole bunch of bestseller lists. Uh, and we got a big smile right there. So that's, a, that's an awesome start to this. Um, so the book, Six Weeks to Happy, uh, Amazon bestseller, Wall Street Journal bestseller, Barnes & Noble bestseller. Uh, we got a new life block quiz to get this gamified, to get people really engaged. So we got a lot going on in your world. How you doing, girl? I'm good. How are you doing, Nick? I can't complain. Um, it's very happy to be on video with you um, and very happy to talk about this because this is another one of those topics. Everyone talks about how to market your business. Everyone talks about how to be on social media and build your LinkedIn profile and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. However, there are too many people in this country that don't know how to market themselves and how to invest in themselves to put them in a position to be marketable. And I think yeah. that's where you have had a career of success and I think that's where you come in. So first off, how the heck do you take an idea and a concept and then decide to make a book and then decide to make a quiz? Talk briefly about that timeline, um, because I think it's something that's very misunderstood in today's day. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I'd love to tell you it was a, a, a direct road here and it was like a first hit wonder, but that's never the case. Never. You know, you're, you're usually stumbling and you're, you're course correcting. So. I mean, my, this is even my second career. My first career was in management consulting. And so I learned the world of processing and process flow and optimizing and making everything work. So I learned how to deliver successful results. 
And part of delivering successful results is also looking at your barriers to success. So you have to look at your risks. You look at you have to look at the ways you might fail, and then you have to plan for it, and then you have to manage for that throughout the process. And so I took that same approach when I started my coaching practice. I started seeing these amazing transformations in my clients, and I thought, you know, because I'm a science geek, I need to understand things. I like hear I'm you. Probably like a natural skeptic, not a pessimist, but like I'm, I'm an idealist, I'm an optimist for sure. But I wanted to understand the science behind what I was seeing in these amazing results. And so I studied everything human behavior related. I studied NLP and hypnotherapy to understand the, the workings of the subconscious mind because wow. this is 95 live in that 5% of the conscious mind. But there's so much of us that's beyond the conscious awareness, and we need to bring that to the forefront. And I studied neuroscience because I wanted to understand, well, great, where does the subconscious live? How is the brain processing all of this? What does it do to your central nervous system? Why are we so wired for stress all the time? And then I studied positive psychology because I wanted to understand optimal well-being. And what I found was all of the science started confirming what I was seeing in my clients, and I thought, Oh my God, all of these years I've been searching for, you know, when you study psychology, because my undergrad is in psychology, the first thing you learn is most issues go undiagnosed because people aren't willing to address them. You have to self-report. Yeah. You have to self-assess. You have to check yourself. You have to check yourself in to and, get help. And honestly, and honestly, like self-awareness is lacking as a whole in this country and people are delusional <laughs> and in denial more than they are. And that's why we are, our health crisis is the way it is because people are letting yeah. them go too long in, in denial state. So I agree. I just think that self-awareness is so important. It is. And it's, it's, you know, people talk about what it is to be authentically you, but what does that mean really? And I think I've come to understand, you know, in, in working with my clients, what I came to ask them at the beginning was, so they come to me for happiness and success. They're not there now. So what's missing in their lives and how do I get them from, you know, from current state to future state, which is a happier, more successful you, a happier, more successful life. And what I realized is most people actually don't know what makes them happy. Yeah. And their formula for success is somebody else's formula. It's what they were told they wanted or what they were told they should pursue in terms of education or career or, or life in general. So you come into this life and you get these very basic marching orders like do well in school, pick a career, pick a major, get the job, get the career, get the house, get the kids, get the dog, get the whatever. And somehow miraculously happiness and success will show up. And so you're chasing success thinking happiness is aligned with that. But unless you know yourself and you know actually what makes you happy and what makes you sing, Nick, is not the same as for your parents or your siblings or your friends or for me, for that matter. And so you really have to tap into your very personal formula. It is unique to you. Sure. What makes you feel alive? What makes you tick? You can do a workout and tell me, oh my God, I just found like the most incredible diet and exercise routine. I can promise you that exact routine will not work for me or a hundred people. So life and happiness and success is the same. And so what I found was I was searching for a solution to teach people how to coach themselves. So for that 70 to 90 percent of people who won't seek out the help, we all need it. If you're a human being living on this earth, you need this. And so I, I came together with a formula and I thought, oh, my God, this is a methodology. This is like an actual system. I can teach people to shift their mindset. It doesn't matter if you want better health, more wealth and abundance, or if you want greater inner peace and happiness and living a life that's authentically going to make you feel like you're thriving. I can teach you that in six weeks. And so that's how the book came about. And the book, Six Weeks to Happy, is actually a methodology where you learn these tools over a period of six weeks and it rewires the brain and it rewires your central nervous system away from survival-based thinking and towards a happier, more fulfilling life. That, that actually is the meaning of success, I think. Yeah, and it's great. And not to go down a rabbit hole here, but I think the capitalist, the capital world of capitalism rewires us to kind of be cogs in the machine and kind of think that that picket fence and these things are the dream. But you're not making your own dream. You're being told 
what the dream should be for you because they want more money to spend and more things to do. So I don't want to go down that conspiracy rabbit hole. But um, I, I do think that, you know, and I think the core of everything is his habit forming. You have to know your own level of what you can achieve, how mentally strong you are. And if you're not mentally strong, then you have to form the habits to allow you to create these things. And ironically, you know, I didn't mean to make correlations to marketing, but this is very similar things, right? It, you got to be consistent. You have to sit and you have the principles the same, but you have to allow it to change based on the individual circumstance. Not everyone is wired the same. They don't have the same upbringing. They don't have the same trauma. They don't have the same positive reinforcement. Um, and I also think uh, that COVID really forced people into weird positions. We were we were external. We were looking at globally globalism. We were looking at you know our family across the country. But all of a sudden, because you couldn't travel, the world was shrinking. And what's your support net around you? And I think that has happened in business. I think that's happened in a lot of places. Um, so I think the book um, can be very helpful. And I and I wonder, you talk about survival. So I, I feel like hearing this, people are misunderstanding what survival means. Like we're not in the woods running from a bear. Talk about how brains are wired for survival versus that thriving for happiness and, and to, to optimize uh, your workflows and how you go about your day. Well, it's a, it's a really interesting conversation because, you know, back when we were living in the bush, you know, which is, you know, what we evolved from, our brains were on high alert for danger. Yep. And so if it was a predator coming at us, we needed that rush of adrenaline. You know, yep. it's called the fight or flight response. We've all isn't that, isn't that anxiety, right? I've always been told that one of the problems is, is that, and please correct me because I make my, base my science on nothing, unlike what you are doing, uh, that the we, anxiety is a good thing. Anxiety, we, act, we treat it like it's the worst thing, but you should have a certain level of anxiety because it means you're on alert for stimuli that is negative. So I think anxiety is when you are stressed about what could happen in the future. And I want to separate that from stress because it's not the same thing. So anxiety is when you have a constant state of, of a persistent state of worry about what could happen in the future. And a lot of people are familiar with financial worry, yep. right? Financial anxiety. You know, more than 90% of Americans, for example, don't have a financial plan. I mean, that that level of stress and anxiety every day going to bed not knowing if your bills are going to be paid or if you could lose your house because you got in a car accident that's that's a high level of stress what i'm talking about in terms of survival is you know our fight or flight response so going back to that first analogy of you know our ancestors having to run from danger we needed those instincts we needed that fight or flight response to be working within us so if a predator came after us we could get that rush of adrenaline. It's like a gas pedal pushed on a car. You get to flee and run off to safety. But back then, when you were safe, your brain signaled your body and your central nervous system to say, hey, there's no danger. It's okay to return back to calm. What happens in today's society? Where are our checks and balances? We, you know, what are the things So we're still wired for, you know, to be on high alert for danger? But what is the danger in today's world? If our phone rings, it's anything requiring our time, money, or attention, anything re demanding our energy. We have busier and busier lives every year. You know, over the last 20 years, it seems like companies were downsizing, but the workload never changed. It seems like cost of living was going up, but salaries weren't increasing as much. And so what are the things that are causing us stress and keeping us in fight or flight response? Got it. So keeping us in a highly triggered state. And we have forgotten, or our brains do not now anticipate, do not even understand, what is the trigger that allows your brain to say, oh, hey, there's no danger here anymore. You can go back to calm. And so it's like we've unknowingly strengthened our stress response, but we have forgotten or never had the awareness that we actually have a calm response. So much like going to the gym to strengthen your muscles, we have to learn what those triggers are and then how to train back so that we can rewire our brains and our our bodies back to back to calm because if you're calm you can be in a state of gratitude if you're in a state of gratitude you're in a state that's allowing creativity to flow it's very hard to be stressed and creative at the same time so if you want to be innovative like we need to be in marketing these For sure. days every world is changing so quickly if we want to sell anything you've got to be on top of your game and so if you're in stress mode all the time it's wreaking havoc on your body like wear and tear on a car it's not allowing you to think clearly it's going to interrupt your 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 love and relationships not both in your person not just in your personal life but also in your professional life 
And so finding your way back to balance is actually going to increase your focus, increase your productivity, increase your ability to be creative, innovative, and then be present and really find a way to, you know, find those, that, that winning formula for happiness and success for you. Yeah. And I have to imagine that it's going to also have a direct correlation with your health and your well-being, because now if you're rewiring your brain, you're not necessarily going to that glass of whiskey or that glass of wine to be the the de-stressor, or you're not going to that binge eating and feeling like you have to stuff your face because you want that calm and that's what brings you calm. So if you're rewiring it, you're also have to imagine helping your mind body connection, which is another thing they're talking about a lot more these days. Um, I have to imagine that in itself pays benefits in the long term also. And like you said, you know, you can reach for a coping strategy, which is immediate gratification, whether it's food or whether it's drink or whether it's shopping or gambling or or being on on social media, because that's an addiction. We know it's designed to hit the dopamine centers in your brain, an immediate reward factor. But I've always been fascinated with, you know, I've been a student of of positive psychology and happiness and success for as long as I've, I've known, you know, to be a young adult. And onwards and so one thing i've always been fascinated with is why do we get so excited when we go and take a weekend course or we learn something new and amazing and we try and put those principles into our lives but it's so short-lived so i really wanted to give people a long lasting change what is it that takes us from being excited for three weeks and then spiraling back into old behaviors versus making long lasting shifts and that all starts with mindset so how do you rewire the brain and that's based on the concept of neuroplasticity and what we found in studying neuroscience was the brain actually shows lasting signs of change at the 35 to 42 day mark so that's six weeks right and so that's why i created the six week plan so you're putting in place practice and practice and repetition and over a six week period you're actually rewiring and retraining the brain for long lasting change for inner peace for balance for happiness and to shift into a whole new mindset for success yeah and i think that aligns perfectly with how many times you have to do something for it to become a habit right wasn't it like 30 to 40 times you have to do something consistently for it to become a habit and then i think the next level that you know you can it's great to get to habit but once something becomes instinctual and you just Mm -hmm. do it without even thinking it's a habit that's the level where you're ultimately in that in that and you know you hear a lot about uh the zuckerbergs and bezos's and these guys that are waking up at 5 30 in the morning and they have these crazy routines but they're yes. exactly that. They're routines. So it's yes. not necessarily what the routine is. It's the fact that you're doing it. I'll give you an example. So I had I have two kids. I work and I'm chasing young kids around. Right. So I liked playing video games and I had a hard time working out. So I just started doing the two together. So I sit like a psychopath on an elliptical playing a tablet game. But you know what? 45 minutes goes by like that. My brain's like, oh, you got your goof off fun, but you also did your workout. So all of a sudden now I'm doing 50 minutes on elliptical at max strength without even knowing what's going on. And I think, and and it's not to toot my own horn, but it's just to say that is not what most people perceive as the white right way to work out, but it works for me. So why would I stop doing it? If it works for you and it's fun, you're going to keep doing it. Right. And that was the principle with this whole book is, you know, since happiness and success is really a unique formula, you have to figure out what works for you. So I give a ton of examples of different ways you can do each of the techniques so that people find something that works for them. If you don't want to sit and meditate to quiet the mind, no problem. You can do a walking meditation. You can do yoga. You can do lots of other things that connect your your mind and body that center your breath work and get you back to calm because there's so many ways you can trigger your calm muscle, but nobody knows how to do it because nobody's talking about it in that way. There, you know. No, so I love to hear. I love to hear. I really do because for me, like Dave Matthews Band back in the day, like their 14 minute long acoustic songs was what calmed my mind. I know it sounds crazy, but I would I would zone like my eyes would half close and I would just sit there. And that's not what meditation is supposed to be. But you know what? Screw it. It's what worked for me. So again, that's another problem. People are talking about things things like they're absolute sciences. It's not the case. What works for you? Have yes. the courage to say I'm doing it differently and the self-awareness to know like, you know, sitting there and smoking three joints and listening to Dave might not be the best form of meditation. So the self-awareness to understand how it works and what the benefits are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then the other thing that was important in this whole formula was, you know, I talked about in the consulting world, understanding your barriers to success. So what is going to potentially cause you to either stop or fail. And so that's where the life block quiz came in because I thought we need to start talking about the things, you know, 
that are in our unconscious that are really stopping most people from loving healthy relationships from being able to communicate from not being triggered from you know being triggered from all that you mentioned trauma yeah um we all have trauma if you're a human being you have trauma for sure some of us have gone through some horrific things for sure but many people just have a pretty basic life but they still have things that were traumatic you know, and so how do you move past those things and how do you rewire away? So when you talk about the unconscious, the unconscious prime directive is to keep you safe alive. and to keep you yeah. alive, basically, right? So what does that mean, though? I think back in the day, the unconscious was born to, you know, to keep you safe, to help you survive. But in today's world, I think it was only meant to help you from, you know, if you're crossing a street, how to not get hit by a car right. or something about to drop, how to move your foot so your knife doesn't stab the you know, stuff for your sure. leg, see it falling, you have enough of a moment and enough awareness to pull back and pull away and keep yourself safe. But I don't think it was ever meant to permeate our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors as much as it does. And so what I found in my work was we need to dive into this a little bit because nobody's talking about it. So once you start to dive into the unconscious belief patterns and the behaviors that live there, how do you shift it and how do you give people the tools so that they're no longer blocking themselves, so they're no longer in their own way, you know, so they can go for that career jump or they can start that business or they can start a financial plan or stop worrying. I just really wanted to stop people's suffering and give them the tools they need to be more successful at life because nobody's talking about this. And the life blog quiz is the first step of that. So it's a fun and engaging way to unlock what are those behaviors that are living in your unconscious patterns and then a whole strategy for how to actually master and it's fun because when you take a life blog quiz you actually it, it highlights your unconscious belief patterns your behavior patterns and your triggers uh -oh. how you uh -oh. With uh oh i'm gonna do this thing now that is that's intense right when you're triggered it's intense but it's also fun because what comes out is you get highlighted your animal archetype so it's you know if you're a cheetah personality for example you're you're good to go you are a take action person and i can i can tell based on your energy you're probably that i am too I, I was gonna ask that question i was gonna make you make a guess for me okay i'm gonna write that down guess for cheetah okay i'll take it keep going <laughs> There are different archetypes and so and so what it is so what a life block is is it's really it starts off as a coping strategy so when you were little something made you feel unsafe or alone or unloved or not good enough or you know incapable of wealth or success and so you know if you if you ever read malcolm gladwell's the outliers he talks about the see the three secrets to success that anyone with enormous vision or enormous success achieved and one of them is always a slight so what is it that happened early on in your life that, that caused you to feel one of these ways sure and that becomes a life strategy so if you ended up feeling alone in your life well that's not the end of your story you're going to turn that into a strength it. that's an extension of freudian psychology too right so you're talking the different stages and and, and again this is fake science that i'm talking so Anyway, go, keep going. <laughs> Fred is a whole other right. episode. He was, let's know you've been talking about. So I could tell that you don't theory. like the phrase soft sciences because just, I'm just saying it now because it's funny that they say that. And I think that, first of all, the, the more we know, understand about the brain and the pathways and the connection between the body and the brain, the more yeah. that that comes into psychology, the more, because again, the perception is, is you're sitting with a shrink and you're just talking. And I think what you're trying to do is bring the neurology and how the brain pathways work and the elasticity of how they reform, the, the neurons reform in into it, which takes the concept of soft science away. Um, so I can tell by how you speak and how passionately you do that this is a different kind of psychology that we're talking here. It is a different psychology because I've always been fascinated with, you know, it, not, not that I would say that they're incomplete works, but there was always something missing for me. Like what pulls it all together into Got a it. solution that I can use? Something that's practical, something I could teach people and share with people so that they can do this for themselves because it feels difficult, but it's so not. I promise you, it only takes 10 minutes a day, even the life block quiz, seven to 10 minutes, and you'll uncover some of the secrets. I've had young people take this with amazing results, and they all come back to me and say, I cannot believe how accurate this was. This was well, crazy. I'm very, I'm, very, I'm very excited for it. And I think, you know, you know someone's authentic when you're trying to get them to not 
ever call you again. You want them to get the habits for themselves and be done with it. That's the opposite of what, I mean, medicine these days, no one wants to cure anything. We just want to keep treating it and treating it and treating it. So it is very refreshing to hear. So let's set up a quick scenario. So um, I want to take the life block quiz. One, what mind state should I go into it in? And two, when I get my results, what are my next steps? Because I think it's easy to talk about the gamify part and just that action. What should be my mindset going into it? What should I expect to get out of it? And what should my next steps be? And I think that would be a good way uh, for people to, to know the value of it and how to go about doing it. Well, I think just going into it, just I just be open minded. So the questions are designed to elicit your subconscious language pattern. So they might feel a little strange, but all personality assessments do feel a little strange. It's an A-B test, so it's going to force you to answer one or the other. Some of them are time frame questions. So I used to be like this because I'm trying to pull out, you know, how did you respond when you were younger, even though you may have evolved? And so better to step, answer first thing that comes to mind or take your time, probably answer almost immediately, right? Just to have the, the subconscious part come out. Yeah, you want to just say you're going to trust your subconscious, okay. because if you're in this place to take the quiz, you're in the place of healing and you're in the place for wanting change. And if you're ready to shift your mindset, just give it a go. What can you lose? You know, if we can watch a Tom Cruise movie and believe that he's going to jump from a plane and land on his foot without an injury and then start sprinting across buildings, well, you're suspending disbelief because you want to be entertained. So allow yourself to be entertained. Oh, like it. Okay. You know, allow your subconscious to just just work for you and just say, I'm going to trust whatever comes up is real. And the questions are formulated in such a way there's no right or wrong answer. If you're a human being, 100% of the time, this is accurate. This is going to work. I was shocked at the accuracy myself. You know, when I first put this quiz together, I had a bunch of test runs with it, and I was really surprised at how everyone came back and said, this is this is wildly accurate. This is really, really me. This is how I respond, you know, when I get hurt Love and it. when I'm in a fight. And so, you know, the next step then is, once you actually take the quiz, the next step is called understanding your archetypes, so understanding your animal archetypes a little better. You can download the full results, um, and then we're actually turning it into a whole coaching program called Mastering Your Archetypes, which is launching in the next couple months. So you get to actually jump on coaching calls with me and actually figure out how do you go from level one to level six, where you've taken unhealthy aspects of where these behaviors showed up and you start evolving through it so that you can really unlock your full potential and come out on the healthier side and you can have the wealth and success you need you can have the peace of mind you need and you can have the happiness you're finally seeking I, I, I love it. I'm going to take it. And then before we air this, I'm going to give my version of it. And I'm going to be as honest as I possibly can be. So I'm excited about that. So the quiz is available at lifebotquiz.com. Um, the book is available at sixweekstohappy.com. Um, check them out. Dara, this has been awesome. We are going to have you back because there's so many more rabbit holes we could have went down. I'm going to listen again and then ask more specific questions because uh, my lack of science in my brain has good intentions and I need real answers. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I very much appreciate it. It. I'm going to try this out. I'm going to get you my results and we are going to keep talking, girl. Thank you so much, Nick. Appreciate Take care. your time. Bye-bye. Bye. A lifetime of hard work. Children laughing in the kitchen. Family photos on a restaurant wall. A legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation. Like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 1063 FM. Boy, that was a that was an interview. Uh, Zara is very smart um, and she has put positioned herself in a really good spot amongst both corporate leaders, uh, but also layman's people that that are just getting into the space, and I think that's a very hard act to do. Um, you know, one of the things that really stuck out with me, and of course, this is a marketing show, so we have to make yeah. it about marketing, is survival mode. And while I really think we are in a, a state of of living where people, a lot of people are in survival mode, just drive on two eighty freaking five, and I've, you see, I've it. seen it in marketing for ten years, but yes, but but marketing even more so. I have been in four or five meetings just in the past two weeks where the conversation goes like this. I am doing digital marketing because I see an ROI. I go, cool, 
But if you don't have long-term vision, the, all you are looking for, you're a commodity. You're not branding yourself for the long term, which means either the digital is going to diminish or you're not going to have an, a, a potential upswing to attract more customers. You're always bottom of the funnel. I know that. But because of the state of the business we are in, we have to focus directly on ROI. I so need, I need to show something. I need to show an, a result immediately. Let's call it survival yeah. mode, yeah. right? You are marketing in survival mode to make sure everything is justified. So let's talk the long-term vision. When you add long-term vision in there, a good mass media 30,000 foot brand campaign will increase the effectiveness of all of your last click attribution modeling. If you are doing a Google ad, three show up. If they had heard of you, they're more likely to click on you. Yep. You have all these different elements. So the question I have for you, Trip, what is your advice to marketers who feel they need to be in survival mode right now? Boy, I think, you know, it depends. There are some that are, let's say, don't really have a marketing leader. They're a small part of a, a bigger organization. And I think those are really difficult to stand up, all right? Stand up to a leadership who maybe is giving them that direction. Yep. And that's a resource thing. They might not and have the resources to do it internally. Yep. So I think what my advice in that case would be is acknowledge that they're trying to do something quickly, but with a caveat. And you say to, let's say it's the president or someone in your organization, I'm like, okay, I will do this to get a quick bump and get us, you know, these opportunities. With the caveat, if I can produce this in the next four to six weeks and we get that bump, then I want to be able to take, you know, these dollars that you ask us to hold off on and let's put it into a longer term campaign. But ask for that up front. Ask for yeah. that agreement. Yeah. All right. Now, if you're someone, you know, I've got a lot of peers and I was in it for a long time who's got the credibility, a CMO or a marketing leader. I think that's where you need to be having those long term discussions with the leaders of the organization and just say, I don't think this is in our best interest. Hopefully you've got the gravitas to be able to do that. If not, then you can go back to the same thing. Yes, we'll do this for the next four to six weeks, but with results then we need to be spending for the longer term on our brand. Yeah, but I also think you need to be able to quantify to some capacity what that brand marketing will do. And oh, it doesn't have to be no sales, but hey, I expect we will see a lift in brand recognition right. and brand recall. I expect we will see yeah. a higher click-through rate or a lower cost per click on the digital advertising. I think yeah. there are ways to make the brand messaging tangible. And I don't think people understand that connection right now. Absolutely. And I think what people do is they acquiesce and just do the short term, you know, um, digital advertising and they don't put that, you know, give me the opportunity. If I'm successful, then give me the opportunity to use that funds the way that we intended to do it. For sure. And, you know, I would say most good leaders will accept that. And actually, they're probably, you know, happy that you're willing to, to do that. You know, I've been in that in a lot of different areas, too. I mean, look, you know, we, we used to talk about it with our CEO of it wasn't build it and they will come. It was do the work, prove that you can gain some of the customers, and then I'll give you the resources. And so some of it was guerrilla marketing up front. But we had that agreement that if, if we're successful and start to show that, that then we will get the dollars. It's not then pull the rug out from under you. Yeah, I, I, I think it goes back to our continuing conversation of how hard the job of a CMO is. So oh. I for the goof, I Googled it yesterday. I looked up uh, the demise of the CMO just to have a talking point. So yeah. there was an article I read in 2004. The CMO is not a – it's a new role. I mean, it's, 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 it's been a dozen years. It's been 25 years that this position has existed. And it said in 2004, this article is saying the hardest job of a CMO is overshadowing the CEO. Because yeah. the CMO is the, you know, you're the marketing guy. You're the, you're the affable one. You're always out. You're schmoozing. You're doing all that. So the biggest threat was always don't look too good in front of the CEO. Now what's happened is the CFO has taken everything. And yeah. everything because of private equity and stock and shareholders and activist investors has become a financial incentive. So my advice would be find ways to quantify your short-term, your mid-term, and your long-term advertising. Yep. Don't quantify them the same way. One should be directed to sales because it's bottom of the funnel, but there are other ways. I mean, I yeah. love Google Trends because Google Trends is saying, who's Google? Who's talking about you? Who's searching? If no right. one's searching for you, you are a commodity. You are a exchanged good that you right. are solely relying on price. The other thing is your midterm. What It should not just be a combo of your short and long term. What's the midterm goal? The midterm goal right. should be different for every company. So if you lay those things out and you present those things with data as to here is the plan, here's how I need to stay on this in advance, 
I think there's an opportunity to win. If you try to approach those things on the fly, you are you're you're, you're going to fail. Yes, with, with anything. I mean, if you're if you're making it up as you go, there's times you do that. I mean, there's like times the show, ex- <laughs> yeah, like the show, <laughs> experiential, and, and and you want to take things and, and act on them and be free to do that. But if you don't have an overall plan and you know some. Um, you know areas that you're gonna you're gonna change. You're gonna change with the data you get, and uh, have that um, you know have that plan B already figured out. Yeah, yeah. And and again, you know, the, one of the things are really talked about is complete mindset shifts. And I think this applies to marketing yeah. also. Is like if you're always in survival mode, then you're not appreciating what's going on. Like if you're always like, oh my god, I have to return this much on a thing, then you're not realizing, oh my goodness, look. Look what happened. Look what this long-term marketing did. We're being recognized here, but it just came out of nowhere. Look at the positive press that's becoming from it. So once you leave survival mode, you actually open yourself up to achieve at all of these other things. It's it's the same thing in a person's life. If you're yeah. stressed all the time and you're always, you don't realize how the positives of life, everything's so freaking negative. There's so much good stuff that happens every day. Yeah, that's and why you're not I don't paying watch most TV out there, you know, but uh, or news and things like that. But no, you're right. And I think that's, you know, I, I look, one of the things I do is you know a couple of days a week i block out an hour or more of time i call it prospecting time um but you know it just shows blocked on my calendar and yep whether it's truly calling current customers new customers or sitting back and looking at data it's you know Dude, it's something- it works it, for you. Absolutely. One of the things she said, we, we were in a world where everyone's trying to feed you information and they're not giving you enough, right? So right. for example, they're saying block off time, but they're saying block off time to do this, block off, no, 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 block off time mm-hmm. to do whatever you need to do to use that time the right way. Right. I joked with her, like I work out and play at my tablet at the same time. Yeah. The reason is because I have no time to play video games anymore, which I love doing and right. I want to work out. So by combining those two things, man, I'll do 45 minutes every single day of a crazy workout because my brain has combined two things, one I don't like and one I do like, like- into something in the middle and that is an example of nobody on earth is telling you to do that that is the way to do it because it becomes habit and it becomes something that becomes instinctual so i think that's the other thing and it, it goes the same way when you are marketing when you are thinking about these things you almost have to become instinctual with what you're doing in the day-to-day yeah. so you can explore so you can be open to new opportunities because yeah. the world is built and business is built on exploring new opportunities and if you're not you're in big trouble right exactly and i think if you know that's that's the problem with just looking at the data and in the mindset of the data only and look i love analyst um, but that's why you need to have that dialogue and talk about what it means so um, well, a very interesting discussion. I don't think you're going to have me, uh, you know, jump in and write my book anytime soon. It's I was still, a dol- uh, I was a dolphin, by the way, in, yeah, the, in the past. I, I was a dolphin am, but- and then a cheetah, which is crazy. Uh, and um, I have to follow Bazaar to find out how the heck that happened. Yeah. Um, but uh, Trip, you're definitely going to do it. And uh, I think more conversations with authors. I'm fascinated by the process. Uh, I don't want to write one, so let's just talk to them. Yeah, it's not important for me from a legacy or anything like that. I think I'd rather just uh, you know continue to provide hopefully value to our listeners. Trip, you're a radio now. host. Your so, legacy is cemented. That's all you need, bud. Well, with that, let's uh, let's wrap it up. And you've been listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3. Have a great week, and we'll talk next week. Tonight in Arkansas, there's a mother tucking in her daughter and turning off the light. A business owner is burning the midnight oil. An at-home dinner date is plating up possibility. And it's all happening under one roof. How? The power of a conversation, like the one John from Integrity Solutions had with First Horizon Bank about his vision for a sustainable mixed-use building. Now it's not just words, it's life. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash John. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC.